Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Daryl Weaver. I'm sales engineer for um, the EMEA region uh, for Canonical. And uh, what we're going to cover today, get the right button, is um, okay, who Canonical are, just in case you don't know, we'll briefly cover that. Um, a quick look at Ubuntu desktop and uh, migration methodology, uh, a couple of case studies, and then Q&A. Um, so, um, Canonical. Who are we and what do we do? Okay, so Canonical is the commercial company that is behind the Ubuntu project. Uh, the Ubuntu project is the um, open source project uh, and uh, Ubuntu is the number one OS on uh, desktop and cloud or Linux OS on desktop and cloud, I should say. Um, and uh, will always be freely available with updates and uh, has no subscription charges. Uh, Canonical then provides the additional commercial services on top of that for um, uh, assurance and uh, professional services uh, and support. Um, it, we also do certification of hardware and software uh, for Ubuntu and develop solutions. So let's have a look at the new Ubuntu desktop. Uh, I would imagine most of you are probably familiar with the desktop, um, but uh, the latest version of Ubuntu uh, 12.04 LTS includes the Unity desktop. Um, this has been designed by user interface uh, designers to maximize productivity uh, and screen real estate uh, and is heavily um, dependent on keyboard shortcuts. So if you haven't found it already, um, there is the super button, uh, which we'd really like to rename the Ubuntu key. Um, if you hold that down, that gives you keyboard shortcuts for the Unity desktop, if you haven't ever seen that before. Um, and uh, it's a new interface. Some of you may be more familiar with, obviously, GNOME and KDE. Uh, and so this is our attempt at doing something a little bit different and uh, a little bit new. Um, so the um, latest release, 1204, uh, although we are due a new release very shortly uh, in the next few weeks, uh, the 1204 release of Ubuntu des Desktop, uh, we now have uh, a long-term support program which will provide stability for the desktop for up to five years. Uh, um, hardware enablement is uh, enabled every six months. Uh, so you get point releases every six months with new features. Um, Ubuntu is not separated into uh, releases with or, uh, with or without support. All uh, users get the same um, updates. So you always get the same security updates and you can always be sure that your test systems are running the same software as your production systems that you may actually purchase support for. Um, Ubuntu uh, also has security built in. Um, that includes things like AppArmor uh, for application um, security. Uh, IP tables and currently zero viruses or zero viruses in the wild. Uh, although I'm sure there's some engineers out here in the uh, audience who might want to prove me wrong uh, and write one. <laughs> um, Ubuntu desktop can integrate into Active Directory, of course, uh, via various open source tools, including Likewise Open and commercial partners such as Beyond Trust or Centrify. And of course, now. Zential server uh, with the full Samba 4 support. Um, and uh, we also have uh, virtual desktop solutions and certification for virtual desktop solutions, including from Citrix and VMware. Okay, so now we can see the release schedule for um, Ubuntu. As you can see on the slide, we have uh, new, rele new LTS releases every two years. Uh, these are then supported for a total of five years. Uh, the normal releases are every six months. So if you want latest features, you upgrade every six months. 
but of course it would be crazy to implement a rollout across large organizations or even medium-sized organizations every six months. So the LCS releases are there so that you can upgrade your desktop systems every two years. Um, so um, you can see that there's basically a recommended sort of update path from LTS to LTS release. Um, that allows you to um, have a fully supported upgrade path. Okay, we also do hardware certification. Um, if you're looking to uh, purchase new hardware and uh, roll out with Ubuntu, then uh, the best thing to do is to check the hardware certification list. This is available online. Uh, you can check which hardware has been certified with Ubuntu and uh, make sure that if you're looking to purchase in advance, uh, what hardware will have zero problems. Um, so um, please do check that before you, before you decide which hardware you're going to purchase. We also provide commercial support. Uh, that's the Ubuntu Advantage program. Uh, that includes system management using the landscape tool, um, which is not open source. That is our only closed source product um, that is hosted by Canonical. Or you can have a uh, landscape dedicated server uh, on your own premises. Uh, we also provide uh, Ubuntu Advantage includes professional support and help desk uh, and a knowledge base and legal assurance for those that might be worried about uh, uh, intellectual property uh, infringement. Okay, so Landscape is our system management tool. Um, this has just recently had a new release. Um, it provides primarily package management um, and upgrades. Uh, the ability to manage your whole estate of desktops all from one web interface um, and to uh, apply updates to uh, individual desktop machines or server machines uh, or even in the cloud. Um, the um, features that have recently been released with Landscape um, include uh, being able to do package profiles. Uh, now, that basically means that you can take an entire package list from an existing managed server through the web interface and uh, collect uh, a, a, a um, package profile of that system. You can then apply that to other systems so that the package lists uh, are applied exactly the same. You can even do that with version numbers and you can whitelist and blacklist as well. So for example, you might want to blacklist certain applications or certain application version numbers in order to prevent them being installed on the desktops. Uh, that can be done now via Landscape. Uh, Landscape can also run any script on any machine, um, although um, the way it's done is by polling, so it's not necessarily done on uh, when you request it, um, but you can um, put into Landscape a a script using any programming language and apply that to individual machines. Uh, you can also set maintenance periods on a weekly basis. Um, it also does hardware inventory. Uh, it now does compliance reporting as well. Um, so it will actually tell you um, the um, state of your desktop estate or server estate um, and how up to date they are and how out of date they might be um, because package updates haven't been run um, for a while. Um, there's a nice pretty graph which I haven't actually got on the slide but there is uh, some because it's only just been released but uh, there is some nice pages that show you some um, graphs on, 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 on how, how compliant your systems are. Um, another feature that's been added to Landscape is an API. So we can now integrate with any other product or any other service or you can write your own automation for Landscape uh, through the API. So let's now move on to migration methodology. So if you're intending on migrating your uh, uh, desktops, uh, you need to follow a five-stage plan. 
First of all, uh, you need to scope out your plan, target who you're going to um, migrate, uh, and uh, uh, which are the most suitable users to migrate. Um, identify the applications um, and the upgrade paths and deployment modes for those applications. Uh, put the right manage management infrastructure in place uh, and then um, do a pilot scheme. So, planning. Um, when you're planning, you need to uh, write down and define the scope of your project. Um, basically, write down what you intend to do, uh, assess your network infrastructure, uh, any special considerations to networking or unusual network environments, um, network services that are needed uh, for the desktop to operate, such as DHCP, DNS, NTP servers, etc. Uh, make sure that these are all defined in your document and that they're all um, assessed. Um, Define the compliance requirements as well. Uh, some people may, for example, require being compatible with um, compliance programs like PCI DSS, for example. Uh, you need to include that in your documentation. And uh, you need to obviously review your security requirements. So, for example, user security, firewalls, desktop lockdown considerations, all of those need to be defined in your plan. Okay, um, target, very, very important to target which users and which, organ which parts of the organization are going to be migrated. Uh, I differ identify different types of users. So there may be um, basic users who only require, for example, um, you know, email and web browsing. Uh, and then there'll be other more advanced users all the way up to power users who, and, and knowledge-based users who end up uh, using very specialized applications or advanced applications and advanced features. Um, you need to uh, identify which user groups you can, um, I, I, you can collect those into and define them. Uh, similarly, you need to uh, identify which organizational groups um, you need to um, uh, deal with. So, uh, for example, your different departments like admin, development, support, finance, HR, etc., and which applications that they're going to need. Um, identify your application lists and uh, determine what are smooth migration paths. Now, that would be, for example, if you were migrating for in, from Internet Explorer to Firefox or from Microsoft Office to OpenOffice and so on. Okay, the uh, application assessment is the next uh, part of the uh, process. You need to assess your desktop environment. The desktop environment may include personalization of the desktop, how you apply that personalization. Uh, that needs to be, um, uh, you need to look at that. Um, which office applications you might need um, and, and which other applications that, uh, specialized applications for your particular business. Um, and what alternatives exist. Um, there are, of course, a number of ways of looking at alternatives. One alternative is to um, replace with a similar based desktop application. Um, but, of course, there are now other methods. You could go to um, cloud-based services um, that then are used through a browser and are not uh, part of the desktop estate at all. Um, you could use remote desktop or virtualization to connect to perhaps legacy applications that uh, won't migrate at all, or there is no, no migration path or alternative application, or you wish to carry on using that application. Um, those are alternative methods that you can use to carry on using a particular platform, say Windows, um, and uh, an application that only runs on that, or has developed on that, say, 10 years ago, and nobody knows how to redevelop it, so it's got to run on that platform. Um, you can do that with uh, cloud and virtualization um, and remote desktop type um, solutions um, and then access them remotely. And of course, you need to consider integration into existing systems. 
Um, existing systems can be Active Directory, of course, Zential Server, which we're all using, uh, and um, Nagios for monitoring, file sharing, all of those kind of applications all need to be considered as to how to integrate those uh, with your environment. Now, management systems. Uh, this is uh, probably one of the most important areas. You need to make sure that your management systems in place are good enough for the job. Um, so you need to assess what management systems you already have, what gaps you have, and what you need to, uh, uh, to, to consider putting in place. Um, so for example, you probably need a deployment server. Um, uh, that could be uh, our new deployment server called MAS, that's Metal as a Service. Um, or there are many other deployment servers out there that are based on sort of deploying images. Um, or we, you also need package management, so you will also need to automate uh, the uh, upgrades of desktop machines uh, to make sure that they're on the latest updates, or at least the security updates. Uh, we would recommend obviously using Landscape for that. Um, you would also have compliance reporting uh, for uh, compliance environments. Again, we'd, we'd recommend that you use Landscape for that, but uh, there are many tools that are available for that purpose. Uh, monitoring is another uh, important issue. Um, so for example, Nagios or there are several other uh, monitoring servers out there. Uh, configuration management. Um, is something that uh, uh, should also be implemented. Uh, so using Puppet or Chef or um, a couple of other um, configuration management tools that are available. Um, you also need to um, have trending um, available, so uh, graphing uh, solutions. There is some basic graphing built into Landscape if you, if, if you have a, a, a Ubuntu Advantage support for your desktops. Um, but it's not very advanced. It's, uh, it's a fairly basic uh, uh, feature, although you can add custom graphs. Um, I would say that uh, there are other open source products, for example, Moonin or Cactus or something, uh, which will do that job just as easily. Um, you also need a central logging server. So um, RSYS, syslog is an example um, to collect logs from your desktop systems. Um, Authentication, which would be, um, I've, on the slide here, we've got LDAP and Active Directory, but of course, we're all using Sentinel Server, aren't we? So, um, and uh, uh, again, integration into your existing systems is important at the management level as well, uh, making sure that those systems do talk to each other and you don't have a huge management headache. Okay, so um, then we move on to, once you've got all of that in place, you can move on to an actual real deployment with a pilot test. Um, now, um, I would suggest, personally, most people say um, that you would deploy using images from a deployment server. I would suggest that actually, if you're using landscape, uh, the package profiling is now very good. And, and that would be our preferred method of, 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 uh, of uh, applying a profile to a machine rather than an image. Uh, images are limited in that they're a direct um, clone, uh, whereas a package update, uh, of course, doesn't overwrite all of the machine's um, particular um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, specifics like um, host name and uh, IP address and so on. So. Um, uh, we would recommend that you use uh, now package profiles to um, to, to, to deploy. Um, you obviously need to uh, explore how you're going to deploy that. Um, you can use a, a, a Pixie booting server. Um, there's a number of that are available. Uh, USB flash drives or you know, CDs if you really want to. Um, or you can use our latest deployment tool, MAS. Uh, it's pretty early in development. It's just been released, I would say, and is becoming very useful now. Um, still probably a couple of bugs to work out. So if you're, if you're in technical in nature, you might want to try MAS. Uh, if you're not, then I wouldn't necessarily recommend using it just yet, but probably wait another couple of months. Um, 
You also need to determine a rescue and recovery scheme. Uh, obviously, it is important in any new pilot or deployment to make sure that you can recover and rescue your system um, and uh, still allow people to work. So um, a good rescue and recovery scheme needs to be determined and um, not just determined, not just written down, but actually carried out so that you know that it works. Um, so um, you can carry out uh, your uh, test deployment on preferably standard hardware, preferably certified hardware, ideally, um, and um, perform your integration and interoper interoperability testing um, with all your network services and make sure that everything works. This is the point at which you probably find some things don't work as expected and you need to spend a little time fixing these problems and feeding them back into the process to make sure that everything on the, the next run through uh, will work first time. So this is your feedback process. Um, so the overall rollout plan is basically um, try things out, refine your strategy and deployment plans based on your findings uh, from your assessment and your pilot flight phase, um, and then um, decide how you're going to deploy from your deployment server uh, and build your production images or your package profiles, depending on what your method is going to be, uh, and construct your provisioning system ready to deploy um, your system. Uh, and then carry out the project uh, planning for the migration uh, and um, how you're going to train staff, uh, do the knowledge transfer, basically train staff and support staff in um, how they're going to uh, manage the new system. So, in summary, um, you need to set realistic targets. Uh, one of the things that we need to um, uh, highlight is that sometimes people can be a little bit unrealistic. Uh, and so, it's always a good idea to be very realistic in what will work and what won't work. Remember, you can always go back to a virtualized or remote desktop uh, of an application, a uh, legacy application that works on some particular system or platform. Um, so set your targets realistically. Minimize your deployment risk and the impact to end users. End users hate being interrupted. So one thing's very important, if you don't minimize it, you will get so many complaints as soon as you change anything. You really must minimize it, minimize the impact to the end user. Uh, streamline your systems management, get enterprise support, which of course have been to advantage, and uh, future-proof your desktops. We've got a couple of case studies we can show you. Um, the uh, Gendarmerie in uh, France uh, had a four-year program to move 85,000 PCs to Ubuntu. Uh, the initial program moved all users from Office to Open Office and Internet Explorer to Firefox. Uh, the operating system upgrade was linked to rollout of new hardware, so the impact to end users was very minimal indeed. Uh, this resulted um, in a 2 million euro per year in savings and time savings on upgrades. Improved collaboration uh, and uh, teaching, and uh, employees enjoy an enhanced user experience. And our last case study is, in fact, the uh, Andalusia region, regional government in, um, uh, migrated 220,000 Ubuntu workstations um, in more than 2,000 schools in the region. Uh, they basically got a canonical uh, premium sales engineer who is a single point of contact for you to put all of your issues through. They learn more about your systems and how you work and your day-to-day requirements that way. Um, so we would highly recommend you engage a PSE for any large engagement. So how can we help you as Canonical? We do uh, custom build engagements and pilot projects. Uh, an engagement is usually five days or more, um, devoted to image building or package profiling, controlled rollout, and further customizations. Uh, 
we do landscape management and workshops to train you how to use it and uh, what the best practices are. And uh, uh, we would highly recommend uh, that you purchase up into Advantage uh, support for your estate. And uh, if you're large enough, then a premium service engineer. Any questions? Hello. How do you deal with uh, organizations who have uh, Windows dependent business applications when you face one of these migrations? Sorry, what, Sorry, what was that? Uh, how, how do you deal with uh, organizations which run uh, Windows dependent applications, business applications sure. that maybe you need to virtualize or something, but that is very difficult to migrate? I don't know, an ERP that, that runs on Windows and this client uh, server based with an all paradigm how do you, how do you face this okay uh, well uh, there are several several methods uh, one of them is virtualization on the desktop although i would say suggest that it probably doesn't normally save anyone any money and therefore that's probably not usually the favored one um, but uh, virtual desktop solutions uh, I usually offer a, a path for that. So if everybody's got Ubuntu desktop on their environment, they can still use a uh, virtual desktop solution to connect to a Windows machine that's in the data center or one Windows machine that's shared between a, a group or something like that. That generally saves a little bit of money because you're only buying a certain number of licenses and support with that. Um, and then that can be shared between a number of people. There are, of course, um, certain situations where, um, uh, you know, if everybody required um, a desktop application that was only on that pla particular platform and everyone required it installed locally, uh, there would be virtually no cost saving. If there was virtually no cost saving, it would be very difficult to, um, you know, to, to push that customer for, for a migration. Um, they might have other considerations that that that, that, that might uh, push them to a migration, but certainly cost saving wouldn't be one of them. Okay, is there any way uh, to deploy group policies like on Windows Server with uh, landscape or other tool? Uh, no, not really. Well, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, like uh, shortcuts or uh, shares. Uh, Sometimes in a, in a customer, there is a customer that demands me to put a shortcut in all desktops, for example. And with Windows, you can do a bat file. And sure, sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, there would be ways of doing that, yes. Because you can run any script at all. Um, so from landscape, you could uh, write a script. It was, as long as you could write a script for it, in, in your case, if it was creating a shortcut, that would be a simple bash script. You could upload that to landscape. You create it uh, in the landscape web interface with a name. You could then apply that to a group of machines. Um, so you could apply that to an entire a state of machines or a subset of machines or, or, or whatever. So you can apply customizations in that way. It's not quite the same as using group policies yeah. uh, through an Active Directory tree, um, but it's a way of doing uh, something similar. Uh, as with most of the Unix world, there's more than one way to do it. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um. Uh, well, I've mentioned MAS, which is Metal as a Service. Uh, now, that's primarily designed as a cloud deployment tool, but it's a deployment tool. It uses Pixie Booting um, to deploy an image uh, of Ubuntu. So uh, you could just as easily apply that to a desktop environment, as long as it's a controlled network environment, which um, uh, it controls DHCP uh, over the network. Um, so as, as long as you've got control of that network, you can use a deployment server like MAS. Um, I would say that MAS is pretty pretty good at the moment. We're starting to use it. Uh, some of our technicians are starting to use it now in customer deployments. Um, but I would have to say there's a, still a couple of little bugs 
that mean that um, it mainly something that engineers should use rather than just somebody's expecting to use the, the, the graphical interface. Um, uh, but we would expect, I, I would expect that those bugs will be pretty well fixed in the next two months, I, I reckon. Uh, and that then you would be able to install a mass server, which would be a deployment server, and you'd be able to run it from the web-based GUI uh, to deploy your desktop machines as well. Okay, we are running out of time. Any more questions? Last one. Okay, what? Well, thanks. Thank <laughs> thanks. you.